So we're good? Okay, should I get started? Okay, great. So uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for, for coming. I know it's uh, rough the, the night after the, the, the morning after the, um, the conference dinner. Um, so I'm going to be telling you today about uh, the, uh, Daedalus, uh, the Daedalus framework that I've been working on with several others and our, our new, new ability to run uh, simulations and do uh, different types of problems in spherical geometry, which I think will be of, of interest. To, uh, to, to people in this community. Um, can, can the people in the back hear me? Is this, is this good? Okay, great. So, uh, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm Daniel Lecoyne, I'm at uh, Northwestern, but this is, this is really a, a group effort. Um, uh, there's been uh, many of us who have been uh, working, working on this uh, Daedalus code for, for, for many years now. Um, so uh, Jeff Oishi is at Bates, uh, Jeff Vassell just moved from uh, from Australia to to, to Edinburgh, so, so so not too far away from here actually. Um, Keaton Burns is a, a postdoc at MIT. And ben Brown is at University of Colorado. And I want to specifically mention that uh, many of the algorithms that we use in code and that I will be describing to you today are developed by um, by Jeff Vassell and. Um, uh, most of the code was written by Keaton Burns, so I think that it's uh, really important to acknowledge uh, all the work that they've done on this. Okay, so this the, the main idea of Daedalus is for a user to be able to write out the equations they want to solve in string form and to turn that into a simulation. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is an example. This isn't exactly what you would put in the code, but it's extremely close. So, um, so we have some, some sort of uh, markup language that we've developed. So for instance, uh, this is a simulation of, of uh, boost nest convection in a spherical shell, uh, slightly above the critical Rayleigh number, such that you're in the spiral defect chaos uh, 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 primer regime. Uh, so here we have uh, div u is zero. Um, uh, B here is the buoyancy. So uh, dt, of uh, uh, the time derivative of the buoyancy, minus uh, diffusivity times uh, Laplacian in a buoyancy is equal to negative u dot grad b. So the, the at is our shorthand for dot. Um, and then for the velocity, uh, d, uh, time derivative of velocity minus the viscosity times Laplacian of velocity plus gradient of p uh, minus, uh, this is our, our uh, buoyancy force and then negative u dot grad u, okay? So the point of the code is to be able to translate from uh, something that is easy for people to read into, uh, into a simulation like this. And we're using um, a fully spectral method. I mean, it's, 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 it's pseudo spectral, but, uh, but we're using um, uh, spectral bases in, in all directions. Code is open source, uh, highly parallelized. We've, we've run on at least 16,000 cores and we have uh, good evidence that it will, um, that you could run on even larger computers. It's just that we don't have a computer that's large enough to test. Um, and then the, the last thing, I mean, the, the reason why we're able to, um, uh, to, to have this great flexibility is that the code is written in Python. Now, of course, the, uh, the Python part is not uh, the most computationally efficient. So all, all, all the real work is being done by, uh, by compiled libraries. Okay, the main idea of Daedalus is that we're using a sparse spectral methods. So what, what, what do I mean by this? So first I'll talk about non-sparse spectral methods. Um, imagine that you're, you, you want to use Chebyshev polynomials to represent some function. This is a typical thing that you might want to do. And uh, it, it, if you want to take a derivative of a Chebyshev polynomial, uh, this, this is the, the normal formula that you might use um, where uh, the, the derivative of a Chebyshev polynomial of degree n plus one can be combined with the derivative of the uh, n minus one to give uh, just a Chebyshev polynomial of, of order n. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this, this type of representation is, uh, is what we would call dense because if you, uh, if you take the derivative of one Chebyshev polynomial and you see um, uh, how does that project onto other Chebyshev polynomials, uh, you can see that, uh, that, that there's a lot of projection between the different modes. So, so this is not very computationally efficient. If you have n modes, this, uh, this matrix is going to have order n squared entries. The idea though, 
is that instead of representing the derivative in terms of just our generic Chebyshev polynomials, we're instead going to represent it in terms of Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind. So those are called U's. And now the derivative is just a single Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind. You have a prefactor N. The way that I think about this is it's a lot like sines and cosines. If you take the derivative of a, of a sine, you should think about that as a cosine series. If you want to represent cosine as a sine series, that's not efficient, it's going to be dense, okay? But if you know to, to change the basis into uh, the appropriate one, uh, then you have this nice sparse representation. So here the derivative matrix um, uh, has only one band, okay? And, uh, and just think of this like the wave number. You need to multiply by the wave number. Okay, so, so that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, and uh, ju just as an example, if, if you had um, like a Poisson equation, you want to come up with a matrix representation for the Laplace operator here, um, uh, kind of uh, one way to do this in the dense form. So uh, I should say that, that this is equivalent to collocation. Uh, if people have heard that term, uh, is you, you end up with, a, uh, you, you can end up with a matrix like this. I mean, there, there's different ways of doing it. It's not always going to look like this, but, but, but in general, this is going to be dense. Again, order n squared entries. Whereas uh, what, what, what we would do um, in the methods that we're using in Daedalus is this sparse representation only order n entries. Okay. So that's, that, that's kind of the, the main idea. And, um, and everything that we use is using these types of sparse methods. So I just showed it here for Chebyshev polynomials, but it turns out that you can do this for a very wide class of polynomials. Um, and I, I should mention, I mean, it, this, it's not like this is our idea to do this. I mean, this is in a lot of the classic textbooks, um, but, uh, but I think, uh, so somehow uh, the, this uh, collocation picture is, is still still being used by some people. Okay, so um, so this is uh, in, in 2020 we we finally uh, wrote a paper uh, describing exactly how the code works. Um, I uh, yesterday I learned that we're, we're missing something up here, so I'm a little bit sad about that. But um, uh, uh, this. Uh, what we've been very happy about is that uh, is that our, our our code has been kind of uh, used by by various people in, in many communities. Um, this is a, a plot of the um, the number of papers um, using Daedalus as a function of time. Uh, so so this one that that, um, that was me, okay. Um, and then this one I think maybe maybe two was me, okay. Um, but uh, but but I have to say that in 2020 I did not write 60 papers. Um, so, so, so it's been really nice to see that, that, that other people are using it. And um, so we, we had a nice exponential increase and then uh, we stopped making the plot because it didn't increase exponentially anymore. But, um, but at least uh, uh, at, at this point, there's, there's been over, over 200 papers uh, using Daedalus. Um, uh, ju just to give you a little bit more information, um, we have a website, daedalus-project.org which has uh, lots of information about how the code works and uh, has um, uh, a bunch of documentation, which is uh, mostly in the form of Jupyter notebooks. Um, in addition, we have, we have a user's email list. Uh, over 300, uh, 300 people are subscribed. So uh, every day we get an email or two, people are asking questions about uh, how to set up the problem that they're interested in. Um, the code itself is hosted on GitHub. We use continuous integration. So we, we have a test suite of thousands of, of unit test problems to make sure that, uh, that everything's working as expected. So when, whenever the code gets um, modified, um, it's, it's automatically run on the, on the um, GitHub servers so that we, we know that, uh, that nothing broke. Um, well, at least if something broke, it's not on the test suite. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and this has uh, now been used um, in, in many communities from uh, astrophysics, atmospheric science, oceanography, biophysics, condensed matter physics, uh, and, and, and many others. And I've, I've kind of been surprised at the, the, the very creative uses that people have, have found for this. Okay, so of, of those 200 uh, papers that I mentioned, most of them are, are running simulations in Cartesian geometry. So this is just a, one that I was a part of that I thought was nice. Um, uh, so, so this is a simulation of, of convection um, uh, down in this layer. And then up here, you have a stably stratified layer. 
you get some waves. Um, uh, but 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 we we wanted to to be able to to solve uh, some other problems. And I should say that, that this type of uh, Cartesian geometry, I mean, it's very good for studying the Earth, which we know is flat. Um, but 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 the issue is that I mean, if if you look outside of Earth, I mean, you see that there are things like the Moon that are spherical. Okay, so. So, so in order to understand things in the moon, we, we really wanted to be able to run simulations in spherical geometry. Um, so, so because of that, we, we, we've now moved to, to a new version of the code, uh, which, uh, which uh, that you can use to run simulations in spherical geometry, which is what I think is particularly relevant for, for many people here. Uh, I should say this, this is the fifth version of the code. So naturally we call it Daedalus three. Um, uh, so, so, so Daedalus 2 was the fourth version. Um, and uh, in, in the next few minutes, what, what I'd like to do is um, maybe, uh, uh, hopefully this isn't uh, too indulgent, but to, uh, to, to describe a little bit about some of the methods that, that we're using uh, to, to do these simulations in spherical geometry. Okay, so how, how do you run simulations in spheres? Um, one approach, I, I think this isn't used so much in, uh, in planetary science, but it's, it has been used in astrophysics, is that you take, um, uh, you, you take your, your, your sphere and you just put it in a box. Okay, so, 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 so you use Cartesian geometry. Um, you have a box, uh, you, you, you do something um, outside the sphere uh, so, that, uh, so that the things stay kind of spherical. Um, but, uh, but, but, but when you do this, you, you can kind of end up with some issues that uh, at least some of the times uh, you, you kind of get some grid imprints. So, so the, the simulation kind of remembers somehow that, that it was in Cartesian geometry. Okay, so, so this is, um, uh, I mean, uh, using Cartesian coordinates is very nice, uh, but this is, uh, but we, we kind of wanted to, to, to do something um, uh, using spherical geometry. So, um, so then uh, the, the next thing you can do is you can um, use uh, spherical coordinates, but uh, using only scalar variables. So this is, this is what most people do. Um, uh, so, so for instance, if you know that the divergence of the velocity u is equal to zero, then you can, you can decompose u into two components, uh, some toroidal and a poloidal component. Uh, and now the t and p are both scalar quantities, okay? So, um, so, so, so in this way, you can, you can decompose uh, the vector quantities into scalar quantities and then solve equations for those. Uh, now, the issue is that when you come up with uh, nonlinear terms like this, uh, it involves some, some rather complicated combination of all of these uh, different components. And this is a case where you're uh, incompressible. What if you're compressible? Then, then you need to have a third one, which complicates things. And, um, uh, I guess part of the point of Daedalus is that we, we want to be very flexible um, and in particular to be useful in many communities and, and in, in biophysics, for instance, people are often solving equations where the variables are, are, are tensors, okay? So, so if, if, you have, if you have a three by three matrix that's your variable, um, uh, it's, it's going to be kind of difficult to try to uh, reduce those, those nine entries uh, into, into nine different scalar quantities and try to figure out what all the nonlinear terms are associated with that. So, so because of this, um, what, what, what we wanted to do is figure out how to do spherical simulations uh, where the variables are themselves vectors. Okay, now why is this hard? The, the, the issue with spherical is that there's coordinate singularities. There's two types of coordinate singularities. There's, uh, there's the ones at the poles and there's also the one at r equals zero. Now, it turns out that the ones at the poles, people have figured out what to do with that for a while. So I'm, I'm going to kind of brush over that. And so I'm going to focus on what happens at r equals zero, because that was not very well understood. So that's kind of our contribution. So the way, uh, the, the issue with these, these, these uh, coordinate singularities, these poles, is that uh, your, your variables have to satisfy regularity conditions. So step one is figuring out what is the regularity condition? So, so let's consider some scalar function f, um, and uh, and we're, we're going to worry about uh, what happens near r equals zero, that 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 specific coordinate singularity. So, so, so you have to ask yourself, what is the regularity condition near r equals zero? And uh, kind of the approach that we're going to take here is that we're going to figure out what's the regularity condition, and then once we know that, then we're going to um, uh, pick a basis which which satisfies that regularity condition. 
And thus, when we represent our function using that basis, the function will automatically satisfy the regularity condition. Okay, so, so then everything will be, will be easy. Okay, so uh, how does f uh, behave near r equals zero? Well, uh, something that you can always do, this is always safe, you can just turn it into a function of x, y, and z. And near r equals zero, you can do a Taylor expansion, and we're going to say that the lowest order term is x to some power, y to some power, z to some power. And then we can convert our Cartesian function into spherical coordinates. There we go. Um, so, so this is uh, x in spherical, uh, y in spherical, and z in spherical. And now if you group your terms together, you see you get uh, r to the a plus b plus c. And then um, uh, this whole uh, angular piece here. Okay? And it turns out that, that this you can rewrite in terms of spherical harmonics. And, um, uh, and the, the, the spherical harmonic degree L is given by the sum of the power of the sine theta and the cosine theta terms. And you can see that sine theta A plus B, cosine theta is C. So the L is equal to A plus B plus C. Uh, incidentally, the exact same thing as R. Okay? So what this means is that um, our function uh, is going to go like R to the L times uh, some spherical harmonics of degree L. So more generally, uh, you're, you're going to have more terms. So, uh, so, so, so what we find is that uh, the scalar function is given by the sum over spherical harmonics. And then the radial part depends on which spherical harmonic is multiplying by. But uh, it, it always goes like r to the l as r goes to 0. So, so this, this then gives you a hint. What type of basis should we use? Uh, well, we should use a basis that goes like r to the l. And this is exactly what Andy was telling us about on Monday, these uh, jones warland polynomials, um, where, you, uh, where you use as a basis r to the l times uh, a function of r squared. Okay? And this works very nicely for scalar quantities. Okay? Now, vectors are a little bit more complicated. So to illustrate this, let's imagine you have a sphere, um, but we're going to just look at the equatorial plane. So that's what I'm plotting here. So this is r equals 0. Now, uh, let's say you have a vector which is pointed in this direction. Uh, well, in terms of the uh, unit vectors uh, in, in our spherical coordinates, this vector is in the, uh, is in the E phi direction. So, so it's pointed in the phi direction. OK, now how about if you had a vector which was pointed up on the left-hand side? Okay. Now you can see that this vector is in the negative E phi direction. So actually, if you had a constant vector, it's constant everywhere, uh, just pointed upwards. You can see that it's proportional to e phi to the right of, the, of r equals 0, and it's proportional to negative e phi on the left. So that tells you that's discontinuous. Okay? So this is the tricky thing. We can't use the old basis anymore, because the old basis for scalars, that was continuous. Okay? You can't use that for vectors anymore. Okay? So, 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 so we need to come up with a new way of representing vectors, a new set of bases, which uh, which knows that sometimes you're going to have something which is discontinuous, or, or in general, most of the time you have something discontinuous. As, as an example, I mean, this is just, um, again, some equatorial slice of some simulation, where if you look at the x and y components of the velocity, everything looks completely fine. But then if you write it in terms of the r and phi component, you can see you have this discontinuity. Okay, so the goal is to come up with uh, with a way of understanding exactly what this discontinuity looks like at r equals zero, so that we can come up with a basis which has precisely that discontinuous property. OK, so, um, so, so, so the main question is, how does a vector v um, behave near r equals zero? Um, well, uh, for instance, uh, if v was the gradient of a scalar, which, by the way, is my favorite way of coming up with a vector. Um, uh, you, can, you can write out what the different components are, and you can see that it, it involves division by r. Okay? So um, since we know that scalars go like r to the l as r goes to 0, then maybe this means that the uh, vectors go like r to the l minus 1. Okay? And this is close to right. It turns out that the vector, you have three components, right? and, there's, uh, and basically one of them goes like r to the l minus 1, but not the other two. Okay. So, 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 so this is what we had to sort out. The way that we figured this out was by looking at the, uh, looking at the Laplacian operator. Okay, so for a scalar quantity, for a scalar function, 
Uh, we can write it like this. Um, if you calculate what the Laplacian is, you get some radial operator. And then you get this familiar uh, L times L plus 1 over R squared. Okay? And um, what this is telling you is that the, uh, the regular behavior near R, near R equals 0 is uh, R to the L. Okay? So now we, we want to also try to do this with vectors. OK, so, so, so now I'm going to uh, write down what the Laplacian is for a vector, and it's going to be a huge mess. Okay, but I'm going to try, try to explain this to you. So, so first of all, um, uh, with vectors, you don't want to just use normal spherical, normal spherical harmonics. Instead, you want to use the spin-weighted spherical harmonics. Remember, I said that in spherical geometry, there's, there's two poles. There's at r equals 0 and also um, at the, um, or the, there's two singularities. There's uh, the poles and also at r equals 0. So, um, so these, these spin-weighted spherical harmonics are exactly what you want to do to avoid any issues at the poles. So um, uh, the spin zero corresponds to the normal spherical harmonics, and then you would have a spin minus one and a spin plus one. Um, and the, the idea there, there is that if you start with your, um, with your normal coordinate vectors, uh, the um, E r, E phi, and E theta, uh, it's just a, a, a recombination of the E theta and the E phi, which is going to work nicely for these spin-weighted spherical harmonics. Okay. So, so again, this, this is something that people have been using for a while. Um, but uh, if you take the Laplacian of this, um, as I said, you, you got a huge mess. So, so this is the, the spin minus one component, spin zero, spin plus one. They all have the exact same radial part. Okay. But, then, uh, but then everything else is more complicated. So, so for instance, here you have like, the, again, the uh, L times L plus one times V minus. But, uh, but then you have this other factor, which depends on V naught. Okay? This one for V naught, there's an L, plus L, plus, uh, L times L plus 1. Then an L, another factor here, we have a V minus, V plus. Okay? So, 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 so this is a mess. So, um, so, so what, what, what we wanted to do is basically take all these terms and try to decouple them. Okay? So, so, so I'm going to rewrite this now um, in, in a matrix form. Okay? So, so, so this matrix, the, these are just those coefficients we had. So, so remember the L times L plus one, there's the L times L plus one plus two. The, these are kind of the, the coupling between the, the different spin components. And now we, we, we want to, uh, we, we want to um, uh, instead of using these spin components um, where things were all mixed up, we, we want to diagonalize this matrix so that each, uh, so that each component acts, uh, uh, is, is independent of the other. So, uh, so you can diagonalize uh, with some matrix, uh, which we call Q, and that's, and that's going to transform you from, from the, the spin variables to what we call the regularity variables, as for, for a reason you'll see in a moment. So those, those are the tildes, okay? So if you do that, then for the minus component, you see that we get just, uh, so it's the same radial operator, um, and now it's much simpler. It's just, there's just a single term, it's proportional to the minus, and um, instead of being L times L plus one is L minus one times L. And then this one is L times L plus one. And this one is L plus one times L plus two. Okay. And what's, what that's telling you is that this zero, so we say that this is regularity zero, goes like R to the L. Regularity minus goes like R to the L minus one. And regularity plus goes like R to the L plus one. Okay. So by doing this recombination, we now know that, um, that, that this, this specific recombination of the uh, R, theta, and phi components um, has this very specific regularity behavior near R equals zero. And then that tells us which basis we use for each of these. Okay, so the, the, the basis we use um, are, uh, we call them uh, generalized uh, Zernecki polynomials. Um, so, so again, uh, very similar to the, um, to the jones worland polynomials that we heard about on Monday. The, the, um, I'd say that, that the only real difference is that um, for, for them, they're using a scalar, so, so they're, the a was equal to zero, and then instead of a plus one half here, it's a minus one half. Okay. So, 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 so it's very similar to, to, you know, to what Andy was telling us about, um, but, uh, but, but this is something that then generalizes to, to vectors. Okay. And then uh, just as we have for, for normal uh, Chebyshev polynomials, uh, there's a very sparse representation of derivatives. Okay, so so I, I I hope that wasn't too painful. I just I just wanted to um to, to kind of talk a little bit about uh, about how the how the code works. Um, uh, but but the key thing is that you, you you don't actually need to know any of this to actually use the code. The the only thing you do is you say that you want to run a simulation 
in, in what we call the ball. So, so going to r equals zero, you just give it the resolution and, uh, and that's it. Okay, so uh, how, how much time do I have? A quarter to, okay, okay, good. So, um, so, 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 so now I'm just going to uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about some, uh, some of the simulations that we've done. So the, the first question is, that, does all this stuff work? And, um, and there was a really nice uh, benchmark paper that, uh, that Andy talked to us about, uh, mentioned on, on Monday. Uh, it was led by uh, Philippe Marty, um, where, uh, where they proposed uh, three, three problems. Um, and, and, and we ran these, and this was extremely useful. So, so I, I really recommend, I mean, anyone who's, who's interested in, um, in, in uh, trying to come up with numerical methods for this geometry, uh, this, this, is a, this is an excellent paper. And uh, it was was ex uh, it was uh, very very nice to to have have a solution that we could compare to 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 find uh, all the inevitable bugs. Um, now, what, what one thing that I want to mention is that uh, uh, one of the problems is a is a hydrodynamic uh, um, uh, rotating convection problem, and there, there was some unexpected behavior here actually. Um, at least at least I was surprised. This this is a rotating wave solution. You can see it's like. Um, L equals three or something, um, and uh, but 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 it's 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 a it's a wave. It's it's just constant energy. Okay, um, but 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 it is it is kind of being infected around. So um, so in the uh, in this benchmark paper, um, they uh, uh, they describe what what the energy was, what the kinetic energy was of the state um, for for different codes. I mean, the, so the, the the two best codes were. One by uh, Hollerbeck, which uh, used Chebyshev polynomials, and then um, the code that uh, that Andy told us about on Monday, um, and and something that we were surprised about was that um, kind of as as they uh, increase the resolution, uh, you you might get like a couple uh, like it, it didn't really converge as fast as we were expecting, um, and and by by playing around with things a little bit more, what what we found um, well at, at least uh, with with Daedalus, we were able to show self convergence. Um, to uh, to almost uh, ten, ten decimal places, and the key thing there was that we found that um, that actually what was really important was was the time stepping. So so even though it's a constant energy state, because of the advection, uh, depending on how you were doing the time stepping, the energy would be slightly different. Okay? So so in, in order to to get a very accurate or, or at least a very precise um, uh, energy, uh, it was really important to have a higher order time stepper, so a fourth order time stepper, and then. Uh, do some uh, um, uh, a resolution study in time step size, uh, in addition to just resolution. Okay. So, so, so overall, I'd say that I mean uh, I, I thought that that there was a very nice agreement between our results and and the the other results in this paper. And we we've also done kind of some of the the other um, uh, uh, benchmark problems like like um, uh, uh, Yuli's um, uh, 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 shell shell. Um, uh, I guess that was the uh, Busnesk benchmark and then the, um, the, the analytic benchmark. Um, so, 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 so that was, um, th those are also great, uh, great resources as well. Okay, just, just a few uh, lightning um, science results. Um, uh, a uh, simulation, uh, some simulations run by Ben Brown. Here we're solving the uh, analytic equations in, uh, in, 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 the, in this uh, full sphere uh, geometry. So, um, so div u plus uh, u dot uh, grad log rho is zero. We have our entropy equation, velocity equation. Um, uh, uh, in order to do magnetic fields, where we're using a um, uh, vector potential formulation in the Coulomb gauge. Okay. Uh, so so we, we ran with these uh, parameters here, and what what we found was kind of some some dynamo uh, dynamo states that looks like this. Uh, so this is um, the the radial magnetic field. And the, the interesting thing is that it was kind of um, localized to specific hemispheres. Okay, so um, so this is um, uh, this is um, uh, this is the the phi, phi magnetic field. Um, uh, at the beginning of the simulation, you, you get uh, I mean it's it's this uh, um, uh, oscillating dynamo, um, uh, and and you you get these reversals, regular reversals. It starts off in the southern hemisphere, and at some point it switches to the northern hemisphere. We, we haven't run long enough to see if it ever switches back. Um, the, the, the first thing we thought when we saw this was like, oh, there, there must be some, some error in the code. I mean, we, we passed all the benchmark problems, so maybe, maybe there's something else. 
Um, so, so, so instead of uh, rotating around the z-axis, we tried rotating around the x-axis. We got the exact same results. Okay? So, so, so it doesn't have to do with being aligned with the, with the um, spherical coordinate system. Um, now, in, in the new version of the code, you can also uh, do simulations um, in, uh, in Cartesian geometry. So, so this is a 3D simulation of a cube. I'm just showing you a vertical slice. Uh, for, for this one, we wanted to have no slip boundary conditions on the side, which was a little bit tricky. So the way we did that was that we embedded the cube inside of a sphere. Um, so, 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 so we call this the, the sphered cube, um, which, which I think might, might be a really interesting way for people to, um, to, to do simulations in, uh, in cube geometry in the future. Um, uh, but, but more seriously, this is, I think it's a really nice test because you can see these flows right through the origin, uh, no problems, at least by naked eye. So, so, so this is the sphered cube. Um, a more serious application of this, um, uh, this is showing the equatorial slice through a sphere where we have some heating in the middle. Um, and uh, the area inside of this line is liquid, outside is solid. So this is uh, using uh, the, uh, the phase field method um, and uh, immersed boundary method to, to have this uh, liquid solid interface. Uh, so, so, so you can see that, um, that the convection is able to to melt. Um, so th this one's non-rotating, but I think uh, the rotating case is maybe interesting for different uh, planetary science applications. Uh, this is a, um, a simulation run by uh, Evan Anders, who's a postdoc at Northwestern, um, uh, inspired by astrophysics. This is a convection in the core of a massive star. Uh, this simulation is fully compressible. So we're solving the the compressible equations, but uh, we're doing implicit timing, uh, implicit time stepping over the sound waves. So the Mach number here is about 10 to the 10 to minus four. So that implicit time stepping over the sound waves is uh, is very is very important. Um, and uh, so so these massive stars they have um, they have convection in their core, but they're stably stratified outside. Uh, they have a radiative zone. So 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 this uh, this is the the full simulation. So you can see the the stably stratified uh, envelope out here. And uh, what we're really interested in is these uh, these fluctuations out here, which um, which might be observable. So so far, I've shown you spherical geometry, but we can also run simulations in uh, cylindrical geometry. Um, uh, so 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 this is what we call a Moussinesque convection. Uh, we asked ourselves what happened if you had Moussinesque convection in a mousse uh, on a disk. Okay, so 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 this is it's two D. Uh, you should be able to tell. Um, so it's a two D simulation of a moose heated as, at its hooves and cooled down in its antlers, um, and uh, and again we have this nice flow right through r equals zero. Uh, there's there's no there's no issues with that. Okay. Um, yeah. So so we're we're trying to get into some some more biology here. Um, uh, let, uh, just just two more things that I want to say. Uh, one is that in addition to these. Um, uh, simulations, you can also do, do eigenvalue problems in Daedalus. Um, so, so in this case, I did a bunch of eigenvalue problems um, trying to solve for the properties of Mach waves um, in the radiative zone of one of these massive stars. And, um, and by, by looking at the properties of the Mach waves of different frequencies, we were able to make an inference of the magnetic field um, in the near core region of the star. It was about, uh, so this is a, a B star HD Four three three one seven, my my favorite B star. Uh, it's, it's the only one I know. But um, uh, and and we found that um, that there's about a 500 kilogauss field, or we think that there might be a 500 kilogauss field right outside the core, which incidentally is is exactly what you get if you run a Dynamo simulation of the core. So so that's that's kind of a nice test. Last thing that I want to say. Um, uh, people are always uh, very interested in speed, so um, so so we tried running running a problem. Um, this is a Boussinesque convection problem in uh, spherical shell geometry. Um, uh, this is the phi, theta, and r resolution on uh, the number of grid points. So this is an L max of five eleven simulation. We, we ran on a thousand cores on the NASA Pleiades computer for hundred time steps. We used both Daedalus and Rayleigh. Okay, so. Um, so the okay, so 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 this is how long it took. So in Daedalus, about 200, uh, 232 seconds, and uh, with Rayleigh, I put a range. Honestly, I think I'm using Rayleigh incorrectly because no, normally it was so. So it's around like three hundred twenty seconds. Okay, 
But but it was very strange that like if, if you run at different times, um, it might give you something a bit more, a bit less. So my, my estimate is that the best case scenario for really, I think is around 200 seconds, but it's to say that, that we're in the same ballpark as really. Um, something that, uh, that might, uh, might be a bit interesting is to look at uh, what, is, uh, what is taking time here, okay? So, so in both cases, um, the most expensive thing is parallel communication, okay? So 75% of the Rayleigh simulation, 50% uh, in Daedalus. Now you might think, oh, I guess this means that, that you're scaled out, that may, maybe you should run on fewer cores. That's not the case. I mean, I, I don't really understand how the supercomputer works, but I tried running this problem on 4,000 cores and it was about four times faster, okay? So, so the parallel communication time dropped by a factor of four when I use four times as many cores, which is not normally how it goes, but, um, but th this is a problem that we can run on at least 8,000 cores with very good scaling, okay? Uh, in all cases, the parallel communication is about 50% of the time. Uh, the spherical harmonic transforms, uh, Fourier transforms, uh, Chebyshev transforms, really about 12%, okay? For us, it was a little bit more. So, um, so people make a big deal about trying to make their, their, um, uh, their, uh, their spherical harmonic transforms faster. Uh, at least for really, it's only going to speed you up by 10%. Okay? So, so, so that's not really a big cost, at least for this size of problem. Maybe if you're running with LMAX of 2,000 or 4,000, then it's going to become serious. But, uh, but otherwise, I would say for, for these types of codes, don't have to worry about the spherical harmonics too much. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the solves for doing the implicit time stepping, really 7%, uh, for us that's 2%. Now, this is the difference between that dense collocation method and our sparse Galerkin method. And then there's uh, some other things so like uh, taking derivatives, stuff like that, 5% of the simulation time. Okay, so, um, so, so this is kind of a, uh, a summary of our current capabilities. Um, with, uh, with Cartesian uh, geometry, we can do uh, Chebyshev and Fourier uh, spherical shells. We can uh, do problems on the surface of a sphere. So that's a 2D simulation or 3D. Um, for, uh, for the ball, we can do the full 3D. Uh, one limitation right now, we're working on, on fixing this. Uh, in cylindrical geometry, you can only do a disk. So R theta, there's no Z direction yet. And so, so we're going to put that in soon. We can also do eigenvalue problems in, um, in multiple directions. So, so for instance, in the shell, you can do 2D. That's to say something which is coupled in both the radial and, as, and, um, and latitudinal directions. So for instance, we, and we can use this for time stepping as well. So we can do implicit Coriolis force. Um, so, so, so these are, these are the main properties. And, um, and I guess before stopping, I just want to say one more thing, which is that, uh, we have, um, uh, Mikael and I are running this, uh, this, um, uh, school in, in April of next year, a uh, fluid mechanics of planets and stars. It's in Udine. Um, uh, after the classes, you can, um, uh, you can, uh, go to the, uh, to the square and have a nice, uh, apparel spritz or Campari spritz. So, um, so please, uh, if, um, if you know any uh, maybe more junior people uh, who might be interested, um, uh, please take a look at this. So, so that's it, thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Very nice talk. Um, do you have the papers to prove the Coriolis force implicitly? Yes. Yeah. So that's um, in in the spherical shell geometry. We don't have that working yet in the full ball geometry. So so again, this is something um, that that's kind of on the list uh, as well as doing the full three D cylindrical simulations. So yeah. Just in the follow up, follow up is very nice. The results you have for the benchmark and. Uh, this, what is SP, blah, blah, blah. It looks like a fourth order time stepper. Yeah, so it's a fourth order uh, implicit explicit time stepper. It's, um, it's using um, the, uh, uh, so it's a, a backwards different, uh, it's a backwards differencing formula. So that, that's the, the BDF. Um, but uh, I think that, I think the way that this works is the, so, so you're doing uh, the backwards differencing formula for the implicit part and extrapolation for the explicit part. 
So this is a, a fourth order scheme. Um, uh, so in that one, we did not use the Coriolis force explicitly, uh, implicitly, we were doing that explicitly. So um, the, the way that it works in Daedalus is that all the terms on the left-hand side, the equal sign are treated implicitly and they have to be linear. Whereas the terms on the right-hand side, so in particular, you can see our uh, uh, EZ cross U, which is on the right-hand side, the equal sign, that's being treated explicitly. Yeah, that's a great question. And we, we haven't looked very carefully at that yet, but that's something that we plan on doing. Yeah. But you, you could also download the code and test it out yourself. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, something I should say, installation, um, for a long time, this was the hardest part of using the code. Uh, now, if you have the Conda package manager um, on your computer already, you just do Conda install Daedalus and it, in theory, installs everything, okay? And, and I can tell you something that's a fact is that three years ago, 90% of the questions on the mailing list was about installation. And now it's a very small fraction. So, so I think it has gotten much better, so. <laughs> yeah, so this was, um, I guess the, the main thing that, that we were interested in here was, um, uh, was, uh, was trying to measure what, 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 the, what the Musselt number was. Um, uh, so, because I, we, we actually think that, that maybe the shape of the moose might be optimized to, op, to, to, to get the highest possible Musselt number. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be this moose. Yeah. So this is like, uh, it's a moose that, uh, that the insides have been carved out and filled with water. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, um, uh, the, as I said, the, the Python is not the fastest thing in the world. So uh, to, do the, um, to do the Fourier transforms and the parallel transposes, we're using FFTW. Um, it's not quite an all to all because we're using a pencil decomposition. So, so you only have certain cores talking to other cores. Um, but in, in each time step, of course, uh, every processor needs to, communication, needs to communicate in, at least indirectly with every other processor. Um, so that's, that's why this is 50% of the simulation time. Um, but despite that, it, it doesn't seem to, uh, we, we can still scale to large core numbers. Um, yeah, so I think, well, uh, yeah, so, 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 so we've, um, we've tried several different things for the, for the parallel communication. I think the FFTW seems to work very nicely. We've tried just using uh, F, the uh, MPI, uh, MPI library calls themselves. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing that's used a lot is, um, is we're using um, some linear algebra packages for doing uh, the uh, matrix, uh, matrix solves, so like RPAC or uh, BLAS for, for doing the um, uh, matrix multiply transforms uh, for the spin weight spherical harmonics or for these um, uh, radial basis functions that I described. So for a typical simulation at scale, we think maybe about 90% of time is spent executing external libraries, 10% on the code we wrote ourselves. So that's kind of the, um, uh, the penalty that you have to pay to, uh, to be able to um, simulate convection in a moose. <laughs> 